Oh, great. Thanks very much, guys. I was just typing in case you couldn't hear me because obviously then it wouldn't be working very well. So I'm going to share the screen again. We're just about to start the session. So welcome everyone to the Process Safety Forum. Um, this month is the first one that we're doing in a series of 12, which is trying to embed the learning from our process safety forums rather than jumping from topic to topic every week we've now changed to a monthly format and this is the first one and so i chose the topic of failure to learn which actually means you can ask me just about anything um, tonight that you have on your minds and um, i'm going to share a little bit about um, what we did during the master class and then also some reasons why I've embarked on this journey and some of the reasons why I've chosen the topics that I have for the next 12 months. So we're going to take the same format as we always have, a quick introduction to the topic and the presenters, and then an open floor for questions and sharing. And then about five minutes before um, the end of the session, I'll be announcing next month's topic um, and we'll go into a little bit of detail about that. So an introduction to me in case you um, haven't watched one of the videos, you haven't seen me before. My name is Louise Whiting. I'm a chartered process engineer, a registered process safety engineer with the ICME. I'm also a fellow of the Safety and Reliability Society in the UK. I um, am a facilitator for HAZOP, LOPA, and I've worked over 11 years in large operating companies uh, such as Shell and BP. And now I support in a freelance capacity various organizations through their process safety journey. So what do we what did we discuss this month on YouTube? I mean on LinkedIn. So if you missed what we've discussed this month, I'm going to just give you a quick recap. So what we discussed was our chronic failure to learn in high hazard industries. The incidents that we have keep repeating. And if there was a way that we can figure out how to learn, we can stop having these um, incidents. Learning is difficult to maintain. So sometimes we are able to get learning um, for a short period where people remember the incident that has just happened, where someone has lost life, et cetera. Um, but then um, over time, those people change roles um, and the learning is lost within the organization. We also discussed that potentially 2020 specific challenges may make us more vulnerable to process safety incidents in the near future and in the long term. So what's happening now in 2020 is there's a lot of pressure to focus on new risks that we perhaps didn't manage before. So we're taking our focus off the things that we were managing and putting them on new things. We are also having a lot of people um, changing roles or being made redundant or taking early retirement. And that's not only because of COVID, that's also because of the oil price crash this year. Um, so all of these different things which are happening means that we are focusing on things which we don't normally focus on, which means the things we normally focus on are not getting as much attention as they were. And one of those things typically is um, the process safety performance of our facility. Now this is supported by the data that Marsh uh, published in 2019, showing that there is a cycle about 12 to 18 months after an oil price crash, there is a significant increase in the number of incidents leading to large financial losses within the industry. So what have we come to conclude this month is we need to find a way to learn. And this learning needs to be sustained and embedded in our organization so that any changes that happen we are able to maintain that learning and not make the same mistakes as before. So why do we fail to learn? So I've just listed a couple of things here. Learning takes time. Learning is not something that I can impart on you tonight, everything that I know, and tomorrow you will magically be able to apply everything that I've taught you today. It takes time to embed the learning. We need to practice it in, in the field. Um, so that we can um, reinforce our learning. And then sometimes we need um, somebody to come and check that our learning has been embedded well. So uh, doing a self audit or someone else doing an audit of our learning to make sure that we're continuing to apply in the best manner. Often we feel we don't have the time to learn. There are a lot of pressures on us, especially now with reduced manning. 
we we just don't feel like we have the time we need to be doing the day job right we, we don't have time to learn sometimes we can't see the relevance of other incidents in our situation so it's often before the incident it's often quite difficult to see the relevance of other incidents in our situation so you know how how can i learn from texas city i don't operate a refinery right i operate a pharmaceutical batch plant so how can i learn from texas city or how can i learn from a condo i am making uh, fertilizers it's not my industry it's not relevant for me um however once you've had an incident and you compare it to other incidents it's very clear to see how you could have learned from other people. The mechanisms for learning are often not integral to our organization. So making sure that we embed learnings from incidents outside our organization and within our organization from process safety are often not built into our organization. Who maintains the standards that we use for our facility? Do we have leading indicators? These are the types of mechanisms which will help embed learning into our processes, procedures, practices, and standards, ensuring that lessons learned from previous incidents are maintained. The other thing is, if we are updating practices and procedures, do we always train everybody who's required to use it to make sure that they understand what it is they're supposed to be applying? Or do we rely on them downloading the right version so that they can, um, so that they can apply it later? And often we don't value technical competence until things have gone wrong. So I've seen this in many different organizations and I've also seen it in several um, incident reports. Technical competence is not valued until after we've had an incident. The things that are valued are um, team management, uh, performance improvement, uh, improving uh, production or throughput. But the technical competence associated with engineering, making sure that we apply the standards, making sure we have technical safety competence in the organization, those things are not often valued until things have gone wrong, which by that time, it's too late, although um, if we're going to continue to operate, it's better late than never. So I wanted to give you a little bit of um, evidence as to why I might say these things. So I've uh, compiled a short list, which means we're going to go over the 10 minutes today, but a short list of incidents uh, which demonstrate my point that we are failing to learn and we are still repeating the incidents time and time again, both within companies or organizations or within um, industries or from one industry to another. So in retrospect, every incident today can be seen in another incident. There are no new process safety incidents. And Trevor Kletz fam famously said that he was tempted to say to managers, don't write an incident report. I'll just send you one of the ones from my files because there are no new incidents. All the incidents that we have now have happened before, either a near miss or an actual incident. And we just keep repeating the cycle. And until we can start to embed this learning into our organization, we're not going to get anywhere. So uh, today, just by coincidence, it marks the anniversary of Bhopal. Um, and this happened in 1984. The number of fatalities from Bhopal range from uh, a couple of thousand to tens of thousands, depending on which report you um, read. This was a terrible incident um, as a result of improper storage of toxic and intermediate, um, which was required to remain refrigerated. However, the refrigeration system was shut down to save money. Um, and as a result, when there was an exothermic reaction happening in the storage tanks, excess gas was generated. And then this drifted down into the um, residential area, which was in a valley um, adjacent to the facility and several thousand people died this year so that happened in 1984 you would think that from 1984 to now we could have learned those lessons but this year at the algae polymers plant uh, in India as well there was a release of styrene monomer gas which is a intermediate or starting product for several different um, compounds that algae polymers make um, the refrigeration system had been switched off. There was an uncontrolled exothermic reaction which caused the fluid 
within the refrigerated storage to boil. This generated a vapor cloud. It was a very still night. The vapor cloud drifted over the adjacent uh, population and 15 people died. Several hundred people were referred for medical attention. The videos from uh, that incident are quite upsetting, so I haven't put one up today. But if you want any links to that, you can let me know and I'll send that out. But both of these incidents, if you were reading the incident report, you could very easily mistake these two incidents for each other. The next one is ammonium nitrate. I'm sure no one has missed the uh, Beirut explosion. Now, and we've been dealing with um, ammonium nitrate explosions. I've put here 1947 because that is um, when the Texas City incident happened, uh, where there was a large um, ammonium nitrate explosion. However, um, we've been dealing with these types of explosions since the turn of the century. So in over 120 years, we have failed to learn from the improper storage of ammonium nitrate. And this graphic here that I really like from the visual capitalist shows just the last 20 years, um, all the different ammonium nitrate explosions, the size, how many people it um, impacted. So here you can see the Texas city was 581. Um, and then Beirut actually is 157, but that was uh, still counting at the time. Um, and there have been other more uh, num more fatalities than the Beirut one. However, the Beirut one is um, a very large explosion. So you can see even just storage of ammonium nitrate, we still have lessons to learn, even though we've had several of these incidents. Management of change comes up a lot as a cause or a contributing cause to incidents. I've put up two incidents here. 1974, which is the top black and white photo, that was uh, Flixborough in the UK after there was a change where they took one of the vessels out of service and replaced it for a pipe which was supported on scaffolding. When this was done, there was no consideration for the movement of the pipe. And as a result, when the, the pipe started to move due to uh, vibrations between the vessels, um, the connection failed and um, there was a massive release of uh, reactive uh, material, which resulted in a large explosion and massive um, damage. Now, if we go forward to 2013 at the Williams Olefins plant um, in Geismar, Louisiana, um, this is from the CSB, there was a very large explosion, uh, three fatalities. This happened when there was a change on these reboilers that you can see in the corner here. The reboilers um, were two banks of reboilers and they were to service a column, but to allow for one of the banks to be cleaned offline while the other was online, they executed a change. Um, this change actually resulted in the um, cold side being isolated from its relief valve when the uh, heat exchanger was not in service. Um, the management of change for this change was in, uh, was completed after the installation and the box ticks, ticking about whether the relief was adequate was not ticked on the pre-start of safety review. So in both of these change management was uh, handled poorly uh, which resulted in both incidents quite a significant number of years apart. Now occupied buildings um, there are two incidents here both of them are BP incidents the first one in 1987 is um, the BP Grangemouth Hydrocracker. In the background, um, you can see the control room. And here you can see a part of the LP separator, which has been overpressured as a result of loss of liquid level in the high pressure separator. Um, when the liquid level was lost, the high pressure gas communicated to the low pressure system and it was uh, significantly overpressured because the relief valve was not sized for communication between the high pressure system and the low pressure system. If this had been a normal working day, this was a Sunday and it was at lunchtime. If this had been a normal working day, there would have been significantly more fatalities because there were several people in the adjacent buildings which were damaged as a result of this explosion. Now, if we fast forward to 2005, the same organization um, had uh, BP Texas City 
uh, explosion where uh, 11 people lost their lives, sorry, 15 people lost their lives in an occupied trailer, which was relatively close to the, to the plant. Both of these are placement of occupied buildings, placement of people close to high hazards. And if the lessons had been embedded between these two incidents, there's a potential they could have prevented um, these later fatalities. Now, um, often at the time of Texas City, temporary occupied buildings were often seen differently to permanently occupied buildings, allowing temporary occupied buildings to be placed much closer to hazards. But the people in this building, they were in a meeting, they were not integral to starting up the plant, they did not need to be at this location in the high hazard facility. And then the next one is personal safety over process safety. So often we focus largely on personal safety, mainly because it's easier to manage, right? It's easy to imagine how you could slip down the, the stairs, how you could um, slip on a wet floor. These things are things which are low consequence, high frequency. So we've seen them before, we'll see them again. It's much easier to imagine how we could um, prevent them as a day-to-day -day person rather than a process safety person. Process safety is more complicated. The time between incidents on a facility is normal, normally several years or several tens of years. Um, and you may operate a facility for 40 years and not have a large incident where there is a significant um, loss of life. However, that does not mean that you should not manage your process safety well. The reason that you haven't had the incident is because you are managing your process safety well, or by luck, the holes in your barriers have not yet lined up to result in an incident i.e. you've had near misses. Now I've put up here two incidents. The first one is Texas City. Again, it's just another angle. You can see that the trailers where those people were having meetings are completely flattened by the explosion. And then the second incident I've put up is Macondo. So both of these incidents were within BP. Um, both of these facilities at the time of the incident had a significant focus on personal safety um, improvement and they were actually best in class in personal safety within their business units relative to other business units of their type. However, neither of them had a very high focus on process safety. Um, this is actually what we discussed uh, this month in our uh, masterclass. We went through the Macondo incident, I explained what happened there. I explained how the engineers had contributed to the incident and then we use the bow tie methodology to identify which leading indicators, i.e. indicators before uh, something bad goes wrong, we could have identified to prevent Macondo. Um, we also then followed the same exercise for Texas City, um, but we, we did a brainstorming session uh, to do that. Now, this is in the same organization. After the Texas City incident, there was a big push by BP to make sure that process safety was at the fore as well as personal safety. They didn't want to lose the ground that they gained on personal safety, but they wanted to gain ground on process safety. However, unfortunately at the time, the drilling organization didn't pick up process safety as being relevant for them because they didn't feel that they had any processes. However, process safety is managing high hazard um, high consequence, low frequency events, which obviously the drilling, um, the drilling community had to manage, which they didn't uh, manage in this case. So I've, hopefully I've given you a flavor of why this is important. Again, as I said, um, tonight's topic is so broad, you can ask me any questions, I'll enable the Q&A in a minute. But I just wanted to cover a little bit about how can we learn, all right? We can each be vigilant and read accident reports and apply it to our situation. As we move from role to role, those learnings that we have gained, we can then apply to make sure that we can reduce the frequency of these high severity, low frequency incidents. We can apply, we can apply up to date industry standards. When there is a requirement in industry standards, you can guarantee yourself that at least one person has had to die as a result um, of this. Sorry, Nick, I think you're still listed as a presenter. Um, so if you don't unmute for a minute. Um, and then also we have this, if we use the up-to-date industry standards, we can actually be using the um, 
the lessons that we have learned and the industry has learned from major incidents. The requirements put into industry standards are as a result of incidents and a large number of people have to agree, a large number of organizations have to agree for those requirements to go in. So if you apply those to your facility, it allows you to um, make sure that you're embedding the learnings. We can embed best practices uh, in our processes and our documents. So if we have some best practices observed from other uh, organizations or from conferences, for example, the Hazards Conference was last week, we can start to embed those best practices in our processes and documents. And then finally, if we identify leading indicators to guide process safety management at our site, that can help us identify where we maybe have a problem before we have an incident. So um, that's all I wanted to go through right now. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll enable the Q&A. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can um, ask now. Nick, you are able to talk if you want to ask a question, if you have one now. Um, if there's anyone who has any questions on those incidents or other, other incidents, please feel free to um, use the Q&A function to ans ask questions. I know that over my career, I've, I've watched incident videos and it has really struck me the number of times that I've seen the same causes come up time and time again for incidents. And I really like the CSB videos because often in those videos, they refer to previous incidents which were very similar to the one that they're reporting on, stating how they could have learned. And often they actually go into details about how that specific organization could have learned from, um, from previous incidents at other facilities or sometimes even within their own facility. There was, um, there's a video on a phosgene hose which um, failed and I think there were two fatalities with that, but there had been a series of three incidents that week. And if they'd managed to respond uh, well to the first one, the third one, which was the fatal one may not have happened. I haven't had any questions. Um, does anyone have any questions yet? You can type them either in the chat or in the Q&A and I'm more than happy to ask. As I said, today is the first session where you're actually free to ask any process safety questions. Normally we're, we're confined to a specific topic and next month we're gonna be confined to um, layers of protection analysis. So if you're interested in, in that, um, it will be good to join next month but you can ask me any questions about causes of incidents or my experience um, operating, et cetera. I'll give you guys a few minutes. I'm just gonna mute. I'll give you guys until half past. If there's not any questions, um, then I'll just go on to announce what's going to be happening next week. Um, but please take this opportunity um, to ask questions now um, because, oh, Nick's got a question. Um, what recommendations would you make to a company who has shut down after a serious incident involving a serious injury and wants to start back up? So, um, my recommendations would be you have, you have shut down as a result of a change. So something has happened and it's been significant. I would recommend that you, as a minimum, uh, do a hazard up for the, the part of the plant which has been impacted. Now, even if you are reinstating the plant back to the same condition it was before the incident, I would recommend that you do a, a hazard up on that part of the plant and um, consider the startup sequence. I would also say that um, it would be good to take a sort of structured approach to have a check to make sure that the facility shut down in the manner that you expected it to shut down so that you're actually starting from where you think you're going to be started from. Um, also, the people sometimes when you come back from a, a serious incident, people are obviously very focused 
on what caused that specific incident. And sometimes it's the same as personal safety versus process safety. You can be so focused on um, that incident that you are focused on that to the detriment of other things. So it's just making sure that you have a balanced approach. And then the other thing I would suggest is if you are able bring somebody independent to come and do a pre-startup um, safety review so that you can just have a check. Uh, someone independent can have a check to let you know if um, you've thought of, you know, the, the last thing you want to do is catch what you've missed as an incident during your startup. You're much better to have somebody catch it on paper. So I've got a question from Gustavo. Um, there are conceptions that even these incidents are of low probability. I think this concept should be reevaluated. What do I think? So um, they are of relatively low probability. But if you start to look at the whole industry, um, then obviously you can see that these types of incidents happen quite frequently, um, but not in the same, not hopefully not at the same facility or in the same business unit. So you can, so for example, um, the overfill of Texas City, the, um, the overfill of the column, that had happened actually at Texas City before, before the incident, they had overfilled that column before. Um, however, they didn't identify it as a incident or as a near miss, but it had also happened at several other refineries operated by BP at the time. But because these were not did not result in a major loss or major incident, they were not recorded as incidents. They were just near misses, which were not recorded either. So yes, I think I think that um, if you're thinking about the failure of a type of barrier or the type of incident resulting as a management or change, these actually happen very frequently. Um, and even within one organisation, I reckon that you would be able to find several um, several times where you have had a minor injury or a near miss as a result of for something, for example, management of change, uh, poor control of work. Um, so if you group it into large enough buckets, you can definitely see these incidents happening more frequently. However, they are things which do happen less frequently. So all of the things lining up to get the major incident is much less frequent than, for example, uh, falling from a ladder or um, falling from a scaffolding if there's no barrier. But that doesn't mean that there's not things that we can learn from day to day. So it's making sure that you really identify what your barriers are and you're looking at how those can fail. So I've got something from uh, John in the comments. Uh, he said it's more of a comment. I think the key issue lies more in the organizational mechanisms for sharing, communicating the lessons in detail and learning is then a application of the insights to apply or embed in the systems that ensure health and of the safeguards in the specific scenario. Agree, John. So really having a, um, having a mechanism to capture these lessons, lessons from within your own uh, organization, as well as lessons from outside your organization, a way of disseminating this information in a useful manner so as not to overload people, but to make sure that they um, receive this information and then making sure that it's embedded into the processes, procedures, standards that you as an organization use is critical to make sure that you learn. Now, I think some things I've seen work really well. Um, at one organization, when they updated their company standards, they would run a refresher training where anybody who was certified on that standard would have to attend the refresher training so that it, you would understand what had changed. Um, another thing that I've seen uh, work really well is um, sort of technical training. So a lot of organizations focus on um, process training. So making sure that you are able to follow, um, I, don't, I don't know, assurance steps, making sure that during the assurance steps, you can check certain processes are working, but that's not necessarily the technical competence which is required for the different roles. Another way to make sure that you're embedding these sorts of learnings in your um, organization is making sure that you require engineers of a certain uh, level in your organization to be chartered. 
Now, if you are or registered engineers in some countries, that, that's what they're called. If you are requiring people to do this, they have to um, operate under a certain code of conduct, which will allow um, you to ensure that they are keeping up to date with the most relevant information. It is difficult. I mean, if you consider a large organization who's running um, various different sites, they're likely to have in the order of two to 300 standards. Now, not all of those standards are applicable to all of the, um, to all of the different engineers, but perhaps uh, some engineers have 20 to 30 and others have five to 10, but you can very easily see if there's a mass update that some people are going to be required to get up to speed with a lot of information. And if you consider that in conjunction with what's happening where there's uh, down manning, really reducing to the lowest minimum manning, it, it can you can very easily see how people are unable to keep up with the newest um, updates. I mean, when I was in operating roles, I was receiving in the order of 150 to 200 emails a day, um, as well as having to do other work. So, um, you know, it's really being able to prioritize that and manage that new inflow of data. We, we're having so much more data nowadays. We're having to really figure out how to manage this and how to make sure that um, we are very effectively communicating what we need. If anybody has any other questions, feel free to type them in the chat or to put them on the Q&A. Um, otherwise, in about five minutes, I'll go over to what we're going to be launching next month. I hope that you guys have enjoyed the new format with the, with the sort of pre-learning on LinkedIn, if you wanna give me any feedback on that. I'm really looking forward to next month on the LOPA. I'll be showing you a sort of a traditional LOPA, which is um, uh, more of a steady state instrumented system. And then we'll also be going into details of a sort of, you know, if things are not working very well, how you can use the LOPA um, methodology to assess whether the changes you are proposing, even for a temporary time, are acceptable and which safeguards you should put in place and how to, to assess whether they're independent from each other. So um, I'll be showing you how to do that in the, in the LOPA sessions. So hopefully you'll be able to join for that. And I'm sure that you all have a lot of questions on LOPA because I get a lot of requests to have a LOPA session. So I'm looking forward to next month. If anyone has any other questions, I'm gonna just go through the last slide I have, which is what's coming next month. And if you have any other questions, just pop them in the chat or in the Q&A um, and I'll answer them when I'm finished that slide. Okay, so um, the last slide I have is what's coming up. So um, this month I had one masterclass session, but it was only held at Wednesday uh, at 8 p.m., which is normally the third Wednesday of the month. Um, this month, I'm give, doing a little trial to hold um, the masterclass on the third Wednesday and then also on the fourth Wednesday, but at 8 a.m. 8 um, so ho hopefully this allows more people to attend. So I know a lot of people who are interested in uh, specifically LOPA are not necessarily going to be able to attend the 8 p.m. session. Um, and then this will be supported by a process safety forum on the 6th of January at 8 p.m. on the UK time. Again, all of these sessions you can um, catch up with online. I've also put the failure to learn uh, masterclass in the shop. So if you want to um, take the failure to learn uh, masterclass and have a look at how you can apply uh, leading indicators to your facility uh, using the HSC guidance, then um, just have a look in the shop and I'll send it on an email after this session. So I don't have any more uh, questions or comments. I'm going to give you until 22 um, and then uh, I'll uh, sign off. One of the things that came up in the, um, in the masterclass and as well at the hazard session is um, that there is a tendency for people not to close out HAZOP actions as it was intended by the team. So they close it out literally, but it doesn't manage the hazard. So this is, I've seen several times as causes of incidents. Um, and if you attend the masterclass, you'll see what we've discussed. So Nick has said, 
Um, in his experience, international companies' process safety standards are not as good as they think they are. Although audits are undertaken, they don't appear to do much more than scratch the surface. I'd be interested to know what other people have experienced. Um, Nick, this, this is also my um, experience that these larger, com larger companies have really, what, from what the outside, really good process safety standards. They have all the architecture required to maintain their process safety system, and they've got all the documentation to support it. However, when you actually start to do an audit and really ask yourself those honest questions as to whether it's effective and actually working, that's when the holes really start to um, start to appear because there is so much documentation to manage and there's so many systems and reporting uh, lines and everything to manage that it really becomes very difficult um, to, to do it well unless you really understand the system. And when you consider the high turnover of people generally within our industry, i.e. that a process safety engineer is not going to be at one facility for more than say four years, you can very easily understand that it's, it's going to be tricky for everyone who's in those roles to be fully up to speed with all of the documentation that is held in these large international companies, which is actually why um, some of the international companies that I've seen have moved away from having their own process safety standards or even um, just general standards. They just list which international standards they will be using and they don't put any of their own requirements on. And this is because if you have your own requirements, a lot of regulatory um, frameworks will hold you account to your requirements rather than holding you to account to industry best practice. So if you say for a centrifugal pump that the inlet um, uh, pressure rating and the outlet pressure rating need to be the same, i.e. it's a fully rated pump from suction to discharge valve, um, and you install something which is not uh, like that, maybe because you are following industry standard, which is not to install um, a fully rated pump, but it's to take other protection measures like a relief on the suction. If you um, install that and then you have an incident, maybe the relief didn't work, or maybe you had some other trip or some other function to protect it, um, you will be held to your standard, which actually said to install fully rated from suction valve to discharge valve. Um, so that's why some companies are actually moving away from this excess documentation on what is required to um, help uh, that. So uh, I've got another question from John. I'm not sure where to find the YouTube recordings of these forums or the shop you mentioned. So John, I'll send, be sending an email um, after this session. It'll have a link to where all the YouTube recordings are of the forums. And it'll also have a link for um, the shop, which is louisewriting.com. So, um, and, and that will give you a link to the masterclass there. Um, but that'll all be in a, an email should come 24 hours after the session, if everything in zoom works well. Um, but as well, if you've uh, signed up for this, you'll be on the um, on the distribution for the newsletter. And I'll be sending out the newsletter next Monday as well. So john, if you don't get something in 24 hours from zoom, you'll if you're on the newsletter list, you'll be getting a um, email on Monday with the links as well. But I can also send you one um, after this if you want. So um, if you need, need it sooner, I can send it to you sooner. Yeah, so um, the main thing is, I think, from this is to make sure if you are in an operating facility to have some sort of um, uh, f mechanism to record best practices or to improve your processes and procedures. Um, some of the key processes that you could focus on if you were if you wanted to um, focus on specific things, maybe you didn't know where to start. The first one I would suggest is management of change and document control. So making sure that um, all your documents actually reflect what you're doing and what's in the field. Um, and then uh, with the management of change, managing any changes on your facility to make sure that you, um, so that make sure that you're not installing something which is not being properly assessed by the relevant engineers. And then um, 
so management of change. And then I'd also have something about the incident investigation, but maybe something a bit more focused on um, near miss reporting and how you investigate process safety near misses. Um, if you watch the masterclass, that will really help you identify some leading indicators. And I'll probably just start off with one bow tie, if you have your bow ties already drawn, or maybe one or two process areas, and just see how you get on with that. And then once you have a good feel for what the leading indicators are, then you can then expand that to the rest of the facility and manage it that way. So thank you all very much for joining me tonight. John, I'll send you an email after this with the links. And um, I hope to see you guys at the masterclass uh, in a couple of weeks and also at the next Process Safety Forum on LOPA. Thanks very much, guys.